Welcome everyone, we'll get started shortly. It's your favorite family tradition to drive to that familiar beach house. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michelle Agamloye, and I am one of the co-directors for this year's Future Leaders in Planning program. We have four exciting sessions planned for you in the coming weeks, but today we kick it off with our first session, Planning for Urban Street Festival. So today you're here from our session leaders, Brian Daly and Sarah Buhorn, and you'll also receive a keynote address from Eric Williams, the CEO of the Silver Room Black Party. But before we get started, Courtney Barnes will be announcing our first flip prize giveaway. Good afternoon and welcome, welcome, welcome back to Flip for those of you who had the opportunity to join us for our orientation. For all of the new students, welcome to the first official session of Flip. We are so happy to have you. Um, before we get started, um, we are going to start recognizing students who have been engaging in our online Flip engagement page. Um, and then we're going to have a little fun uh, game that we're going to play later. But um, you'll still have the opportunity to um, earn a gift card if you don't win today. But for the most um, engaged students so far, we would like to recognize Alexis Boganegra. So everybody, congratulations, Alexis. Thank you so much for being super engaged on our Flip Engagement page. And for those of you um, who would like to win a prize in the future, that basically means um, participating in the pre-session content, um, after-session content, uh, that also may include, um, like Alexis did, commenting uh, on other students' posts and engaging with other students. So congratulations again, Alexis. Um, like I said, students, you'll have the opportunity to um, earn a gift card. And gift cards will be distributed um, after the program uh, completion, so in August. Um, and I am now going to uh, um, pass it on to Brian Daly and Sarah Buhorn. All right, thank you so much, Courtney and Michelle. And again, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so we're really excited to talk to you today about street festivals and urban planning. Um, but first, let's kick things off with a poll. So where was the last festival you attended?
All right, we'll give it a few more seconds here if anyone else wants to answer who hasn't already. Okay. So, um, all right, as you guys can see, it looks like half of you, the last festival you attended was on a street or sidewalk, so very appropriate for today. 30% um, it was in a park or plaza, and the rest uh, a mix of parking lot, private property, somewhere else, or never been. And none of you said that it was online, though that might change um, as time goes on. We'll see how the COVID situation goes. So thank you for participating in that poll. Um, all right, and so today, the plan for the session, Brian and I are going to share some introductory street festival concepts with you. Then we'll hear from Eric Williams about the Silver Room block party and his experience actually building a festival. Um, then we'll have some time for a question and answer with Eric. And then we'll introduce the uh, interactive activity afterwards. So please, during the session, um, drop any questions you have in the chat box, and especially the questions for Eric that you have. Um, and these can be the ones that you came up with ahead of time as part of your pre-session work, or just anything you think of as he's talking. All right, so <clears throat> you might be wondering uh, what street festivals have to do with urban planning. Well, if you watched the intro video for today, you'll remember that um, one of the core reasons why we plan is to create a sense of place. And as I state in the video, creating a sense of place is the, one of the greatest outcomes of planning efforts. And a term for the process of creating a sense of place is placemaking. So, uh, festivals are actually one type of placemaking strategy. In general, placemaking involves creating unique spaces that capitalize on a community's assets to promote vibrancy, investment, and quality of life. Placemaking is creating quality places that people want to live, work, play, and learn in. So some placemaking strategies are permanent, like urban design standards or programs that encourage inviting buildings and spaces, landscaping, or public art. And then some placemaking strategies, like street festivals, are temporary. Street festivals can be complex or simple. So in the photo we have here, just putting some lights and tables um, and removing the traffic made it an inviting space and people turned out for it. So festivals and other placemaking interventions generally involve using public space. So public space includes gathering spaces such as plazas, squares, and parks, as well as connecting spaces like sidewalks and streets. So in the pictures, we see some examples of public spaces, a park being used for a special festival on the left, the Chicago Riverwalk on the bottom right, and the street intersection on the top right. So public space is public in terms of its ownership and use, while private space is individually or corporately owned. Some private spaces are also open to the public, and not every space falls neatly into a category. Placemaking can be thought of as a people-centered approach to the planning, design, and management of public spaces. Theoretically, a public space should be open and accessible to all peoples, regardless of gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, age, ability, or socioeconomic level. So often when we think of streets in our mind, we think of the right picture as places for cars, parking, and the movement of goods. But throughout time and across cultures, the street has held social, commercial, and political significance as a symbol of the public realm. Even in the US before widespread adoption of cars, urban streets were full of pedestrians and vendors, as we can see in the picture to the left. And we still remember that streets are sites of political significance today when people take to the streets during protests and during street festivals. So in urban areas, streets actually make up a non-negligible non -negligible portion of public space and overall land use. In Chicago, for example, there are over 4,000 miles of streets and the public way represents almost a quarter of the city's land area and over 70% of city-owned public open space. 
So there are actually a variety of placemaking interventions that occur in streets. Uh, so planners and communities are increasingly considering non-motorized experiences when designing streets. And this is the idea of complete streets, streets that are designed and operated to enable safe access for all users, not just cars. A complete street will contain space for bikes, pedestrians, cars, and buses to safely travel. So here we can see a street before and after a complete street redesign. So in the next slide, we see other placemaking interventions that occur in streets. Um, one of these are shared streets, and actually COVID-19 has um, allowed us to see more shared streets in the city of Chicago. So the top is a picture of a program um, that Chicago launched, a temporary shared street program that basically gives pedestrians and bicyclists um, full use of the street to enable proper social distancing. And other streets uh, remove traffic from the street during certain hours to allow for additional outdoor dining space. So these programs that I mentioned are temporary, but shared streets can also be permanent, which we can see in Chicago's Argyle neighborhood. And finally, the intervention we're talking about today are street festivals. So street festivals usually involve totally closing a street to traffic for a period of time. They require careful planning and coordination and they can be very successful in helping create a sense of place and in connecting people to their environment. So Brian will tell us more about how communities use culture and festivals as part of placemaking and explore some practical considerations before handing it off to Eric. But before Brian's section, we'll have another short poll. So how can street festivals be used as a tool for social change? And you can pick multiple selections here. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, so thank you for voting. Um, so most of you thought that it was useful as a tool for social change because it can bring communities together. Um, other popular answers were to establish community identity, support local businesses, provide a gathering space, and finally bring together business, art, and government. Um, so, and as you see, really all of these are valid options. So um, let's hear from Brian more about street festivals and how communities use culture in the street festival. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, connecting events and spaces to local culture is a major component of placemaking. Festivals can be one way that communities accomplish this goal. Here at the Puerto Rican Festival and Parade in Chicago's Humboldt Park neighborhood, you can see permanent public art, the archways over the street that represent the Puerto Rican flag, uh, and a special event, in this case a parade, uh, and how they complement one, one another. Uh, they highlight the Puerto Rican flag and culture that is prominent in the neighborhood, and they've drawn a big crowd. Cities and villages throughout the Chicago region and throughout the world use street festivals to showcase unique elements of their local culture. There are plenty of examples here in our backyard, like the World Fest in Albany Park and the Argyle Night Market in Uptown. Throughout most summers, you can find festivals happening many weekends and weeknights in most of the region's cities and towns. If your town or neighborhood hosts a festival, what does it highlight? Does it feel connected to things that make where you live a unique place? Different ways that festivals can showcase local culture include music and dance performances, which are often featured at festivals like the Lunar New Year Festival in Chinatown in Chicago. Performances can be a way to showcase neighborhood culture and to raise the profile of local institutions like clubs, uh, performance lesson spaces, and things like that. Uh, they can draw in a new audience that gets interested in what kind of performances they do, and it gives them a visible platform for new audiences. Food is another big part of many festivals. 
showcasing local cuisine is a way to highlight some of the local businesses in a neighborhood, potentially hooking new fans that come and eat that food at the festival and then want to come back to the neighborhood to support that restaurant or vendor that they enjoyed at the festival. Festivals can also be a way to establish a connection in people's minds between your town or neighborhood and something about the broader culture that they want to celebrate. This is a picture of the Pride Festival in Aurora, Illinois. Uh, Pride is a festival that happens in cities throughout the world. And it can be a way to build an association between your neighborhood and food, music, or cultural identity that attracts people from far and wide and makes them think about where you live in relation to this element of culture that they feel attached to. There are also bigger festivals like Pitchfork and Lollapalooza. These don't really highlight any element of local culture, uh, but they make Chicago a music destination and bring in a national audience. And that's similar to the role that national conventions and conferences play uh, by drawing in people from throughout the country or throughout the world uh, to come have a memorable experience in Chicago uh, hopefully encouraging them to come back again. Festivals also bring trade-offs. Attracting visitors and patrons for businesses means dealing with traffic, strain on transit service, and the need for security, waste management, and other special needs. Building systems that can handle competing demands is a big part of urban planning. Balancing competing uses and the positive and negative impacts of social and economic activities are some of the core functions of urban planners. We usually think of that in terms of more permanent things like what kinds of transportation systems are put in and where and how different parcels of land are used for different purposes. How does a city or region have a vibrant economy while also managing pollution? How do people move around a region without causing congestion? These are the kinds of trade-offs that urban planners think about but many of the same principles apply for temporary events that use public spaces. One way that planners become involved in festivals is through permitting processes. Permits spell out what festival organizers must plan for and pay for to get permission to hold their event. Typically festivals require special event permits, but what counts as a festival? If you have lots of friends over to your home, to your backyard, to your porch, you don't need to get a permit from the government because that's on private space. Usually the need for a permit is triggered if your event will close, use, or put structures up on public space. So if streets or sidewalks are going to be closed, if food or alcohol is going to be served, or if a tent or stage is going to be put up on any part of public space. Permit processes can help the city or town determine what services they will need to provide and how they will be paid for. Some of those questions are outlined on this slide. Uh, what kind of public resources will the event require? How many attendees will there be? A good, permit, a good permitting process isn't about putting all of these responsibilities onto the festival organizers or onto the government. A good process should be more about making sure that someone is taking care of each of these questions and these important responsibilities. So some more specific examples of the kinds of trade-offs that can come up when planning festivals. Uh, one is environmental concerns. In 2019, there were endangered piping plovers nesting at Chicago's Montrose Beach, successfully hatching several chicks on a spot that hadn't seen these birds in many years. Uh, there was a festival scheduled to be held on that beach that summer, and it had to be canceled to protect the nests of these birds. Was there a way that both of these things could be accommodated? Maybe not at that site and maybe not on short notice, but are there ways that organizers and planners could have avoided this uh, situation by planning ahead? And a big trade-off that's on everybody's mind right now and a, a need that needs to be balanced is public health. Big festivals like Lollapalooza are attended by hundreds of thousands of people. Taste of Chicago can attract over 1 million people over several days. And even smaller street festivals can attract tens of thousands of people. Visitors are often in close proximity to one another, sharing food, dancing, and congregating in groups. This year, most people felt that the trade-offs couldn't be managed while keeping people safe. Public officials determined that these festivals couldn't really be modified in our current situation and be held safely. Think about ways that you might imagine festivals in the future evolving to accommodate public health and being safe and uh, allowing people to attend festivals in person, uh, even in times with public health crises like COVID-19. 
One way that people have adapted in the short run is to move festivals online. With most of the street festival season for this year canceled, some groups have tried out novel formats. Do Division is a festival that's held in West Town uh, that moved online this summer. They offered live streaming, streaming musical performances and provided links to the websites of some of the street vendors who would have been selling things in person so that people could support them online with their purchases. Think about what kinds of elements of festivals can easily be moved online and which ones you lose out when you do it this way. Do you think online should also be thought of as a public space? I think that's something to think about as you think about your activity in the uh, next phase of this um, session. So we'll think about the trade-offs that you have to manage online versus in person and what communities lose when a festival moves online. Before we welcome our guest speaker, uh, we do have one more poll question for you to answer. The question is just asking, have you attended a neighborhood block party? We'll give you a chance to answer that question. All right, it looks like most people have voted and about three quarters of you have, uh, have attended a neighborhood block party. Uh, and several more of you would like to in the future. Uh, so to hear a little bit more about neighborhood block parties, we'd like to welcome Eric Williams. Eric Williams is the founder and creative director of The Silver Room, an innovative retail, arts, education, and community event space opened in 1997. The Silver Room intersects the worlds of fashion, music, and visual art, and acts as a boutique gallery and community arts center. William spearheads the Silver Room Block Party. In its 16th year, attendance has grown to host 40,000 people. A 2019 economic impacts report states that the Silver Room Block Party, a one-day celebration of community, culture, and music on Chicago's South Side, has an economic impact of $2 million. Since his 2018 Harvard Loeb Fellowship, Williams is excited to develop opportunities that revitalize Southside communities and fuel their economic growth through retail, arts, and culture. Williams holds a degree in finance from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, and with that, we'd like to welcome uh, Eric Williams. Hey, <laughs> what's up? Thanks for the intro. Um, I'm happy to be here. Talking about the block party, it's funny. This wasn't even planned, but I'm in my office right now, and this is a photo. Can you guys see the photo? It's a photo of the block party <laughs> from, uh, from 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 two years ago. Uh, so yeah, so this is awesome. You guys are talking about street festivals. This is this is this is this is interesting. Um, I think I can maybe start by giving you a little bit of my history, my personal history, um, and how I got into the festivals and my view of street festivals in general. Uh, so my father owned a bar in Robbins, Illinois, and it was a blues bar. So I grew up around blues music and stepping music and just music in general. Um, and then my uncle actually played a bass for Sun Ra. I don't know if those of you know Sun Ra. Um, so music was always a part of our, of our upbringing. Uh, fast forward to my, my, my teenage years, growing up in the 80s in Chicago, I was a big fan of house music. And that probably had the biggest influence on me, going to hear um, le legendary DJs, Ron Hardy, Frankie Knuckles, and just seeing what music did, you know, to the spirit, uh, how music brought people together. Uh, if you know, for those of you know, house music in the 80s was mostly a black gay uh, nightclub music, you know, and as a straight person going into an environment especially in the 80s, that was very different from right now. It was very homophobic in general, a lot of neighborhoods. But going to um, gay nightclubs was, was different for me. I'd never seen it before. But the one thing in common was that people loved the music. So in some ways, it didn't really matter. You know? uh, so I saw that that was immediately a way to, to bring people together who were, who were different in some ways. Um, as a child, I always enjoy, you know, block parties. Like, no, I mean block parties meaning like on your block. I used to call them block club parties. You know, so you would block off just as one block. And you would have, your, you know, your, your mom, your auntie would come out, cook some food, and maybe have a little grill on the street. You know, and the kids would, you know, would get, get like these like little small, like little um, uh, pools, would throw some water in the swimming pools. Um, we would have, we would open up the fire hydrant. That was always like a staple of block party was open up the fire hydrant, you know, 
and all the girls would come out and jump double dutch. You know, like those were like the staples in my memory of block parties where double dutch and open fire hydrants and kids running through fire hydrants and somebody would always come out with their music and their turntables and, and play music. And it was just a sense of freedom. And so that was always for me, what was most important was the sense of freedom. And the idea of blocking off a street, you know, when you normally it's traffic and cars, it's like, oh, we have control now. You had the sense of control because you were you were the owners of the street for this one day, you know. Um, so that was those always like memories I had, you know, and then I could fast forward back to my teen years and thinking about block parties uh, in New York, where they really kind of took hold, especially in, in hip hop culture, you know, with this guy Cool Herc, who I became kind of cool with later, and, um, and Bambada, uh, Af Africa Bambada was his name, and Cool Herc, they would throw parties in, in the parks, you know, on the streets, you know, and these were illegal, they weren't sanctioned, licensed, you know, block parties, they were just something people did because they wanted to have fun. You know, and they would um, hook up electricity from light poles. You know, this is all done illegally. They would take cords and hook up, you know, their uh, their sound systems to light poles, and people would come out and this is you know the very beginning of break dancing. You know, and 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 cardboard. We would have like this cardboard boxes, put the cardboard boxes on the streets, you know, and, and dance. And again, like you would have all ages. It would be kids. It would be the you know the seniors, you know the grandmothers. Everyone would come out. Uh, the block parties actually from New York uh, were, uh, were actually um, inferred from and really harken back to the block parties in Jamaica. Uh, the, the, the Silver Room Block Party, the actual name is called the Silver Room Sound System Block Party. That term sound system comes from Jamaica. They would have sound systems and you would have folks who would have these big huge like trucks and they would have like speakers on these, on, on these trucks. And so you would have the selector, who was a person who actually played the record, you know, and you would select the actual record, uh, you know, and you had these sound systems and you would compete. So whoever had the biggest sound system is where people went. So if it was you know, four blocks away, this guy had his big boom, boom, playing reggae mostly sound system. And this other person down the street had a bigger sound system. They would try and draw the crowd. So it really was about like who had the biggest sound. It was like this, it was just this thing of like pride. Who, who, who had the biggest sound system? So uh, Cool Herc, uh, culturally, culturally, his family was from Jamaica. So when they came to New York, they brought some of this, this whole Jamaican thing. Also, these guys, this guy called Soul to Soul, if you guys are familiar with Soul to Soul, in, uh, in London, the same thing. That all stemmed from actually Jamaica. So you had this, 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 this confluence for me, you know, uh, this house music from, from Chicago, by way of New York also, and then you had this thing happening in the parks, you know, in New York City. And then you had, for me, this reference of, of, of Jamaican sound systems and bringing folks together. Um, also something that really inspired me was this event um, in Germany. I was in, I was in uh, what was it, Cologne? Yeah, I was in Cologne, Germany. This was back in the late 90s. And I went to this, um, this event, it was a festival that was sponsored by some museums, right? So each museum got to sponsor a food vendor and music. And so one, 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 one museum would sponsor, say like Jamaican food and a visual artist, right? The next one will have like Polish food and like somebody playing African music. And the next one will have, you know, food from Mexico and music from Russia. It was just like kind of all over the place, but I loved it. It was the first time I'd seen a festival that wasn't like a rock fest or a hip hop fest. You know, that's how we grew up. You know, you go to a hip hop festival, you know, or a concert, it just be one kind of music. And I was like, wow, this is all kind of music. And what that did, the diversity, what it did is it brought people who wouldn't normally come, because if you don't like hip hop, then you won't go to a hip hop festival, you know? But what this did is it brought people who wouldn't normally be together in the space and they would kind of commingle. So you had these Russians and these T Turkish folks and these folks from, you know, from, from Chad. And I just found that really, really interesting. And I think about that now because later it informed me how I approached what I was doing. It wasn't just one kind of music. It wasn't just one kind of anything. The idea is to bring different kinds of folks together. So uh, I was on the board of the Chamber of Commerce in, in, in uh, a Wicker Park. And at the time, this was in the early 90s, and I was asking for some diversity in the entertainment in, in, in their festival. 
it was very like rock focused. And I'm like, okay, cool, but we're in Chicago, you know? This is a, a very diverse city. We got, you know, Humble Park over here. We got salsa music playing. You know, this is a home of house music. You know, I got my friends who, 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 who can MC. Let's have some diversity in this music because if you only focus on one type of music entertainment, you're gonna get one type of person. Um, but I realized that they weren't interested in diversity. They were interested in just having this one kind of um, music and which would bring this one kind of person. So after probably two or three years of asking why this is not, uh, it's not more diverse, I was told that they didn't want to have any problems. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? What are you, what are you trying to say you don't want to have any problems? And I realized what, what that meant also. I said, you know what, I'll just start my own thing. So the following year, uh, I lived next to the, the original Silver Room used to be in Wicker Park. And the first Silver Room was at 1410 Milwaukee. And I lived above the store. And right next to me was an alley. It was, it was not Milwaukee Avenue. It was the a alley that went from Milwaukee Avenue to that to the alley. It was like a little half street, and it held probably a hundred people. And I would see this alley every day, and I would see people go through this alley. I would see cars park in this alley. I would see people throw trash in this alley, and I kind of fell in love with with this alley because <laughs> I, I lived there. You know, like wow, people like that. Not this is this is a, this is a nice little street. We can make something beautiful out of this. So my original idea was to transform something that people see as ugly, which was this alley, to something that was very beautiful. And you don't notice streets when you are just driving down them or walking through them, you know? But you can transform a street when you block off traffic and you create something that's a little bit different. So I was really excited about using this alley uh, to actually hold my street, my, my, my quote unquote first street festival. And at the time, I think my first one I did was 2003 or four, I can't remember, I think it was three. In 2003. And I went to the alderman. I said, hey, can you give me a permit for this, this little alley? And he looked at the, the map. He goes, this is not the actual street. This is the alley. And I said, oh, yeah, I know, you know. And he says, well, never, I, we've never given a permit for alley before for a festival. I'm like, well, you'll be the alderman known as giving the first permit for that for an alley. And he was like, sure, why not? And he gave me his permit. And so we, we, we did it. So And I did it that way because I didn't have to block off Milwaukee Avenue. That's a much harder thoroughfare to, to block off, you know, from Ashton to Damon. This little alley was going to be easy to block off. And so we did it. Uh, I had no budget, had no money. I went to Home Depot. I got some extension cords. And we ran cords from my house upstairs down the side of the building. And that was our music. Uh, we took cinder blocks and we built cinder blocks, took a piece of wood. And that was our booth for our DJ. And we had some cardboard that we had. You know, and that was our dance floor, some, some cardboard boxes. Uh, I got some, 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 some spray paint and inside of my building. I had some friends that were artists. I said, hey, can you, uh, you guys paint on the building? You know, like, okay, fine. And look, that was it. And, and it was maybe 100 people came throughout the day, but it was so much fun because it was a sense of, a sense of freedom. You know, and I think for the first time, people, at least in that neighborhood, they saw that this was for them. I had, you know, salsa music, we had uh, house music, we had a little bit of everything. We had kids performing, I always have kids perform. So I think that, you know, for me as a, you know, I'm older now, but even back then, I wanted to make sure that this was something that was for all ages, truly all ages. So, you know, you could be a 40 year old woman and bring your, you know, your, your, your four year old kid and he or she could feel safe. Uh, or my grandmother could come and she could feel safe. So that was always the mentality I approached this with to from year one to year 16. Uh, the next year, everybody had a great time. The next year, people came back and we went to probably three or 400 people came. And then the next year, we'd moved down the street to a little, a slightly larger space and we might have had a thousand people came. And then the next year it was 2,500 and it was 5,000. And it was, and last year it was 40,000 people that came. Uh, so this was not something that I planned initially to say, oh, we're gonna have this 40, 45,000 person street festival, it was really out of love. It was really out of this idea of bringing folks together and having fun. Now, you know, year 11 through 16 looks very different from year, you know, one through 10 uh, because of money, uh, because of licensing, because of insurance, because of permits, uh, because of all those things that come with large crowds. I remember the first year, I didn't even, the first probably six years, I didn't have a porta potty. I would like, oh, go in the store. You can use the bathroom in my store, you know? And, or, you know, people would go, go wherever they went, you know? Now you got to get porta potties. They cost, you know, 
whatever, 200 bucks a piece. You know, you gotta have 80 porta potties. So now these costs are escalating. Because also too, the block party was always free. Because the first year I was like, okay, I can pay three, 400 bucks. I, I can afford that, you know? You know, last year, I think it was about $300,000. So, I mean, these costs just escalate because you have to block off streets. You gotta pay the city. Uh, the first year, as I just explained, by generator, I mean, our, our, our power was me with the extension cords going to one you know, booth. Last year, our power was, I think we spent $30,000, $35,000 just uh, on generators alone with, you know, with run. So it just becomes this whole, whole host of things you don't think about as the event get, you know, gets bigger. For me, I still wanted to keep the spirit of what the event was, which was about bringing folks together, it was about togetherness, which is about happiness, which is about diversity, uh, living in this kind of city that we're so separate, you know, how do you bring folks together, you know, at a street festival? And I think we've, 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 def we've definitely done it, you know? And also uh, the last several years, you think about the economic impact, which you mentioned a little bit earlier. You know, the first year, the first year actually, the first year I was trying to bring folks down the street. Okay, so, so, so my store was not at the six corners. It was more towards like, you know, uh, Levitt, right? So folks would kind of congregate at six quarters, but they wouldn't come down the street. So I said, well, what if I played this loud music and had parties, people would come down, you know, down the street, and then they would also shop, not just in my store, but also other stores. So that was also the original point was like, okay, that's all your questionnaire at the very beginning. And it was all of those things, you know, definitely when you, you know, host an event, you're going to bring people to a community, they're going to spend money. They're going to go into restaurants, they're going to go into stores, they're going to spend money with the vendors, which we didn't even have vendors uh, the first probably 12 years. This was truly like a street fest, a street event. Um, as the cost, you know, started to, to, to rise, I had to figure out ways to help to raise money. And one of the ways you raise, you, you raise money is by having street vendors. You know, so I said, okay, if I can charge, you know, street vendors, you know, three, four, five hundred bucks, whatever it is, and you get, you know, 80 vendors, you know, you can make thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. So that's the way to kind of help pay for things is, is, is through street vendors. Um, I didn't want to charge people uh, at first, but then it got to the point where now you have to start asking for something. In the city of Chicago, in a public way, you technically can't act, you can't technically charge, which is why you see signs that say donations. Um, they're very specific about not saying cover charge because technically, legally, if you live on the street, I couldn't charge you to go to your house. So all street festivals that are on city property technically are donations. And people know that, and many of you have walked through the booth that says donations are not given. I don't like you for that, but you don't donate, you know? And so the ways you make money to pay for this are donations from, from the public, which some festivals are you looking at 30% of people actually pay. 20%. Uh, some are higher than others. When it's a neighborhood festival, people kind of understand where the money is going or, you know, somebody's putting this on, you might hit 70%. But not everybody's paying to get in. And it's, you know, it's five bucks, it's 10 bucks. You know, you need a lot of people to add up to $300,000, uh, $400,000, whatever you, you're spending for a street festival. The other way you make money is through sponsorship, obviously. So now you have, you know, and for me, that wasn't the point. It wasn't about having banners and you know and beer companies blah blah but as your cost starts to rise you're like okay who's going to pay for this the folks are not paying because they don't want to donate um i can only charge my vendors so much money i have to get sponsors and, and when somebody gives you a check for you know ten thousand twenty thousand dollars they, you know, they're gonna want their name plastered so it kind of changes the parent with all of you you know in the 16 years I've never made money from our block party and you know it's not sustainable honestly and the reason that I never made money because it wasn't the point at first and you can lose I can lose 500 bucks you know I, I can lose a couple thousand dollars now you're talking about 10 20 30 40 50 100 200 thousand I can't lose that much money it's just not sustainable so now you figure out how do you keep the vibe that you want to keep you know, pay the artist, you know, get money coming in. So now you're dealing with all this logistical stuff 
and the thing that you used to do that was the fun part that kind of kind of goes away now you're like okay is this a street festival or is this like you know some some something much bigger than that in the last few years it's become such a something much bigger than that which is you know the festival i've always called mine the block party for a reason that's that's not by accident if you look at all of our marketing it never says festival it always says silver room sound system block party because I wanted to keep the vibe of what a block party meant. And for me, that was hearkening back to my childhood. That was seeing little kids playing. That was seeing the kids, you know, run through the, 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 the fire hydrants. Um, this very organic kind of event that we put on has now is not that. So uh, for me, it, it's been like the balance. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would love to, I know I got a lot of questions it looks like, so I could probably stop now and just probably spend the rest of the time answering the questions. And that's it. I'm a very transparent person. I, I think, you know, we live in a city which is so tough for me to not have street festivals, not just mine, but, you know, others I go to. I go to the, you know, the Randolph Street or the Well Street Art Fair or, or the African Fest or I go to I go to Puerto Rican Fest. You know I mean, like, this is why we live in, you know, in the city through these crazy winters. And now we don't have that, it's kind of like tearing me apart. So I will answer any questions you might have. So feel, feel free, so. All right, thank you so much, Eric. That was super interesting. And I definitely learned things I didn't know. Um, so yeah, as you noted, we have a lot of questions. I think Brian and I will be um, helping to read those off and um, yeah, so to kick us off, then we have a question from Denilson. So um, how, they wonder, how do we continue festivals with social distancing? And will there be, will there still be a profit for businesses with the added expenses due to hand sanitizers and possibly fewer people attending? Uh, my personal opinion is I don't see how you do it. That's just my personal opinion. I'm, I don't know, I, I see it's 53 questions. I haven't even looked at them but I just don't enjoy the virtual experience. I'm, I'm old school, you know what I mean? So the point of bringing, of a festival is to bring people together. I mean, I look at this photo right now, people are having, <laughs> people are having a good time, you know what I mean? Like, and part of having that good time is that you're in a close proximity with other people and you're feeling that energy from people and you're dancing and you're sweating and that cannot be recreated virtually or six feet apart. So I've been asked to do virtual uh, virtual fest. I just mm, I'm just not interested in that. I mean, I'm gonna do something different uh, online, but I'm not gonna uh, call it a virtual silver room block party. I, I, that would be like an insult to what place making is, what what bringing folks together is. It's not on. It's not virtually. Just not. It's something different, but it's not what we do. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so another question here from Samira. So except for keeping the block party name, how did you still keep your festival organic and like the block party you had when you were young? Um, some of it is the messaging. You know, every year we, we have a different theme. It's beautiful people, we come in peace. Uh, so I always have like these kind of like, like these like hippie kind of themes, you know? But I put the energy out there that people know uh, that they're coming to have a good time. I always, always, always have a heavy presence of, of kids. And not just like a kid's section, like kids perform. You know, so we have like uh, the High Park School of Dance. You know, these are seven to 15 year olds performing in front of adults, you know. We have, you know, just different genres of people, you know, to, to keep it organic, you know. It, it's harder to do that as, as you evolve money, you know, like I said, like, the beer signs over here, this tin over here, and this structure, you know, I always try to have, I always leave, always leave room for something to happen that you have no idea what's gonna happen. You know, and, I, and that, that sounds kind of crazy to say that, but I think that's, that's really, really important. You know, everything can't be planned down to the hour, down to the, the space. It shouldn't be actually, you know, you have a certain general idea of what goes on, but the magic happens and the fun happens from the people that come to the space. So for me, I look at it as, I'm just kind of setting this up. You know, I'm gonna provide some good music. I'm gonna, you know, do these certain things, but really it's about the people that come. And I didn't even have security for the first 12 years. Um, and obviously, you know, you know, you can't do that now, but my feeling was that we're all family. You know what I mean? So if it's Sarah, Michelle, and Courtney, I know that they ain't gonna cause no problems, you know? And so that was always the kind of vibe. Obviously now we have security that costs $35,000 worth of security now. 
So it changes, but I think the spirit was, was, is, is, is always there. Yeah, and it's um it's really interesting too how you've moved the festival around throughout the years. So um Karina wonders what are some changes you've seen in the community of Hyde Park compared to Wicker Park and maybe uh the experience of setting the festival up or the block party up rather, you don't call it a festival, in each of those neighborhoods. Oh, it was totally different. Um on the north side it was so much easier to do it and I could probably maybe not, not now but there's probably reasons for that but um my personal experience has just been so much harder on the south side and number one you have universities right here so you have people who have certain expectations of how things look um you have a community that is deeply embedded of homeowners also who they want things to go a certain way you know uh on the north side in Wicker Park you have more it's younger and you have more renters who, you know, they're like, okay, this is great, you know, like, and there's more festivals on the north side. So it's no big deal to have a fest when there's hundreds of them on the north side of Chicago. There's, there's a lot less out here, so people kind of, they're a lot more protective of their space. So that's a general answer, there's other answers, but that's a general answer. So it's been much more, and it's bigger out here, that's the other answer. So it's much more difficult, much more expensive to do it on the south side than as opposed to the north side. Okay, thanks. Um, so another question from Amy. Uh, do you think urban planning efforts lack the aspect of culture, art, music when thinking about designing spaces? Is there more education needed in planning to teach students to consider using streets in creative ways besides just transportation? Yes, and uh, you mentioned before I had a fellowship. Uh, I was a low, uh, a low fellow a couple years ago, and a lot of things I did at the GSD was talk about this idea of public space and, and arts and culture and how that works in the urban planning. So yes, the folks are definitely talking about it. They're, they're definitely thinking about it. So for me, I come more so from arts and culture that, you know, than I did urban planning. You know, it was, me it was really more so like thinking about what I did as a form of urban planning and not the other way around. I just did what I did. I didn't even know what was called urban planning. I didn't know what was called placemaking. It was just me bringing people together, you know? So um, people, I see people definitely thinking about space differently now than they probably did 10 years ago. Yeah, that's really interesting how you can, you know, approach it from different ways, um, but it's all part of the same goals of creating a sense of community. Right. Um, yeah, Brian, do you want to jump in and um, ask a question from the students? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, well, this is a question from Rhea. I don't know if this will be a hard question or an easy question, but for you personally, what's your favorite part of the Silver Room Black Party? That's a really good question. I have two favorite parts. It's so funny you asked that because I think about that the day of the Black Party. I have, I have three favorite times. My first favorite time is when I first hear the music. So, you know, the event starts at 12 o'clock, but we're up there at four or five o'clock in the morning after not sleeping like before. So you have to block off street closures and you know, now you gotta worry about towing cars. I hate to tow cars, but we put up signs and inevitably somebody's not gonna move their car. So you have to make a decision of like, do you tow this car or not? So you go through all the stuff, then you have this system of people who come, you know, to bring all of the stuff that, you know, is comprised of making a festival, like the, the gates and then the porta potties and then, you know, the sound system. And so, I started seeing all the stuff is starting to come. Like, okay, all the stuff is starting to come and everybody's working, putting stuff together, you know? It's, the staging is important. You set the stage, you can't set up sound until you do the stage. So now, stage gets set up and then they're finished and the sound guys come on and they're putting da 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 and then you hear that boom, boom. I'm like, okay, cool. Like now, the sound is on. That's my first, that's my first favorite part. It's like, okay, now, now something's happening. Um, and then usually around two or three o'clock when you see families come like the kids and like the older folks, you know, and, and they just like, you know, the, the women jumping double dutch is always one of my favorite things, you know, and people just like having that really, really good time. So that's like my second favorite time was like that, that two, three o'clock time. And then the last lady is the end of the night. Usually I'm on the stage uh, with my friend Ron Trent, who always closes the night out with house music, because I feel like that's like a good spiritual ending to the night, people just dancing. Um, at the end of the night when it's like, 9.45 and we got 15 minutes to go. I'm like, okay, cool. Another successful event. No, 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 nothing went wrong. Nothing, we've never had, not, not even an argument, let alone a fight, you know? 
Um, and everybody's just having a good time. You're like, okay, this is why I do this, you know, and everybody's having a good time. So I would say those three, those, those three moments. Great. Yeah, I can see why. Um, so we also had some questions about um, sort of community relations and, and festivals and block parties. Um, and there's a question from Angie asking whether you think there's a fear that block parties contribute to gentrification of certain neighborhoods in the city. You know what, you're gonna, Angie, you're always gonna have, you know, some, some haters, some naysayers, however you want to call them. You know, you bring 40,000 people to a space, even not, just not just me, anybody, you're gonna have some detractors. Some might say it's gonna be, bring violence, neighborhoods being gentrified, it's too much traffic, it's too much noise, it's gonna be always too much something, you know, but the vast majority of people get what's going on, and I focus on those people. So if some people say it's going to cause whatever problem it is, and you know, so be it, so be it. So I don't really even think about that. I know, for at least for down here, what I know is we bring a lot of money to these vendors, and they thank me for it. Because if you spend 500 bucks for a booth and you make $6,000, then that's a win. And from that money that you made, these young, young people, young women and older people, they can, you know, hire folks in the neighborhood, especially on the South side, you know, now they have money to, you know, to go buy more material or take a vacation or feed their family, whatever it is, you know? So for me, it's a twofold thing. It's a cultural thing for sure, but also these people that come, they have money, they come to spend money. And so that's my main concern. Great. Yeah, I can see how, you know, working with a lot of local vendors and local businesses and setting up the block party, you know, can, can be a great way to make the community feel involved in it as well. Um, so another question, uh, this is from Alexis. What advice would you give for people who want to do a block party in their own neighborhood? Don't do it. <laughs> um, start small. I would, you know, I think this is business. You no, know, I've been in business for, you know, over... 25 years you know and I think people sometimes get too locked into the details I'm not a detailed person I mean I'm not that's from good and bad to that but for me it's worked out you know um don't overthink every single detail don't think everything has to be perfect don't think that everyone is you know you're not going to have any detractors I mean just go into it with a good heart and a good spirit um with a good purpose and a good mission try and get as many people involved as you can uh, to get allies, whatever they can provide, be it you know, financial, be it you know, lending a hand, a hammer, or, or some art, whatever, get folks involved as much as you can. Because then it's not just your event, it's, it's everyone's event. And I still see the block party that way. It's not, it's a silver room block party, but it's everyone's block party. You know, because it's the artists, it's the people that come, people that dance, they give the energy, the people that support financially. It's, you know, we, we all contribute in different ways. So my advice would be, to get as many people as you can uh, involved and, and then have fun. End of the day, it should be, should be fun. Great, yeah, that's great advice. I think that's a theme that the students are going to hear throughout this program, the importance of getting more people involved, engaging neighbors, getting more perspectives in there. Uh, so I think we'll hear that again. Uh, so we have time for just one or two more questions. Thank you again so much for sharing your story and your time I with us. a long time. Um, Sorry, man. <laughs> No, it's great. Uh, Sarah, did you have any um, any other questions you wanted to ask? Um, I do have one question. So I know in, a, in a, um, an interview that was published, you mentioned that you want to create a practical model of the Silver Room success and maybe replicate it in other communities. Um, so I wondered how, how this initiative is going and um, if you see this as being replicable, especially since it really originated from you and your interests and background. I think so. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure which, which, which talk you heard me, you know, uh, say that, but I think what I probably meant is I'm not interested in having like a franchise, you know what I mean? Um, but I have learned certain things along the way of doing this for, for so many years. And I know the importance of, of cultural spaces, the importance of bringing people together and the economic, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the money that's involved in this and economic uh, considerations, you know. So I think what I was, what I was trying to say is that if we can do this in Hyde Park, let's say we did something in Austin, right? It would, could be, it could look differently, but it was done in Austin or or in South Shore. Uh, one of the stories that I still stands out in my mind is about 
five years ago, or yeah, three, well, about four or five years ago in Hyde Park, I heard this kid talking, and he was probably like maybe 10, 11 years old, talking to his friend, his older brother, probably like around 13, 14. And he was like, man, this is the first time I've seen so many black people together, and I wasn't afraid. You know, and I, I think about that, like, wow, like, what does that mean for this little kid? This, this sense of hope that we can come together and have a great time. That I think sparks other things. Then you have this this one day event. Um, okay, great, it's so a one day event. But then what's what about the next day? What if somebody see, sees a storefront that's empty in that neighborhood? Oh wow, you know, maybe we can have a little storefront over here. You know, so it's really to spark something else is the way I look at it. It's not about just the one day. Yeah, and that really makes sense because I know you have a lot of community events just through the Silver Room as well. So it's all part of a community building effort. Um, so we just want to uh, read a comment from Catherine. Um, let me pull that up. So um, Catherine said, being a resident of Hyde Park, I find the block party a really great opportunity to bring a lot of people together to have a great time. And I thoroughly enjoyed the experience when I went. So hopefully the other students and everyone on the call has an opportunity to um, experience this as well. and. Um, you know, definitely in person, since we know it's not translatable to virtual, but we're so glad that you could be here with us today virtually. Um, so thank you so much, Eric. We'll give you a round of virtual applause. <laughs> and for, for anyone that has, I know I see it's like 60 some questions. Right. Um, hit me up and I'll respond to everybody. Okay. Eric at silverroom.com. That's my email address. You can drop it in a, in a thing. But yeah, seriously, hit me up. I'm, I would love to answer any questions you, you might have. So. Yeah, and we, um, we're definitely keeping all the students' questions. So we might help to facilitate that too. So the students um, can, of course, contact you directly if they want. But yeah, we will definitely work that out with them. Um, and thank you for making yourself available. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but before we close out, we just have a final slide for our interactive activity. So Sarah, I'll leave it to you to uh, do the last uh, explanation of the activity. Sure. So um, as a final continuation of everything that you heard today, we're asking you to head over to the Festival Reflection tab on the week one page of the FLIP Engagement website. Um, so hopefully you're already familiar with this website, but if not, the link is in every email you've received from us um, about FLIP. And so the prompt is basically to uh, give us a picture of a festival that you've attended or a festival that you'd like to attend, or even a drawing of a festival that you'd like to create. And then um, just answer a few questions that Brian and I wrote about your festival, such as the type of place that it's held in, um, the audience, the impact on the community, and really anything else you'd like to share. So hopefully um, with everything you heard from Eric and the other things today, you can think about how to create a sense of community and place um, in the location of your choosing. Thank you, Sarah. And I just want to thank Sarah and Brian for doing a fantastic job today in leading our session, uh, planning for Urban Street Festival. In addition, thank you, Eric, for your presence. Uh, it was so informative hearing about how you started this block party and what has inspired you. So we are uh, thankful for your presence today. I just have a couple reminders before we close out. Uh, please tune in to our next session next week, which is the truth about drinking water. That is at 2 p.m. next week, Thursday. Uh, the Zoom links for each session is on the Engagement HQ page, so you'll be able to access that session next week. In addition to that, um, after completing the post-session assignment today, please head over to week two to complete your pre-session work assignment, which is on water affordability. Uh, that again is on the FLIP engagement site that you can see right here. And if you have any issues accessing the site, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to assist. Uh, but uh, we want to close out with another uh, prize winner. So I'm going to hand it off to Courtney to announce our final prize winner for today. 
Yay. Uh, so we're going to uh, uh, move into our prize for today. Like I said, you still have a chance to earn um, throughout the program. So be sure to stay engaged on the FLIP engagement page and also make sure you pay close attention to um, our presentations throughout the weeks. So um, Eric's presentation, he mentioned a hip hop artist and someone who inspired him um, who also had block, fest, uh, block parties. Who is that person? Please submit your um, answer in the, the chat and the first person with the right answer will win the um, gift card. So I'll repeat it again. Um, which New York hip hop artist influenced Eric to start his block party in Chicago? So he mentioned this person several times. I'll give you a couple moments to submit your answer in the group chat. I wish I had like some little music to um, <laughs> while we're waiting. No, Eric, I need Eric's help. Eric, can you give us some hints? <laughs> Did Eric, I think Eric dropped off. Um, no, not Mr. Porter. So he was a DJ. He mentioned him a couple times. Jack, you're so close. <laughs> um, I'll give a few more, a few more seconds. Yes, Marcus, DJ Cool Herc. Congratulations, you are our winner um, for this, this week's, this session's gift card. So uh, once again, gift cards will be given um, at the end of the program. Um, and uh, like I said, continue to engage on our Flip Engagement page. If you do have any questions, um, I will submit my email in the, um, Michelle, can you actually type it out for me, please? Thank you. Um, please email me if you have any questions about using the Flip Engagement page or getting set up. Um, I had a few questions asked me, is it, um, are they already pre-registered? No, you are not. So you do have to sign up uh, on your own. And also be sure to go under your profile and make sure your name is visible because sometimes we don't understand, we don't know who, you know, uh, LL number three is. So please spell out your name for us um, so that we can give you the credit you deserve. Um, thank you again, Michelle, I'm gonna hand it over to you to close us out. That's all everyone. We will see you next week, Thursday. And don't forget to complete those uh, post and pre-session assignments. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>